Full Circle by Sue Grafton. In this story, a detective sees through false pretenses to solve the murder of a young woman. The accident seemed to happen in slow motion, one of those stop action sequences that seemed to go on forever, though in truth no more than a few seconds have elapsed. It was Friday afternoon, rush hour, Santa Teresa traffic moving at a lively pace, my little VW holding its own despite the fact that it's 15 years out of date. I was feeling good. I just wrapped up a case and I had a check in my handbag for 4,000 bucks. Not bad considering that I'm a female private eye, self-employed, and subject to the feast or famine vagaries of any other freelance work. I glanced to my left as a young woman, driving a white compact, appeared in my side view mirror. A bright red Porsche was bearing down on her in the fast lane. I adjusted my speed, making room for her, sensing that she meant to cut in front of me. A navy blue pickup truck was coming up on my right, each of us jockeying for position as the late afternoon sun washed down out of a cloudless California spring sky. I had glanced in my rearview mirror, checking traffic behind me, when I heard a loud popping noise. I snapped my attention back to the road in front of me. The white compact veered abruptly back into the fast lane, clipped the rear of the red Porsche, then hit the center divider and careened directly into my path. I slammed on my brakes, adrenaline shooting through me as I fought, as I fought to control the VW's fishtailing rear end. Suddenly a dark green Mercedes appeared from out of nowhere and caught the girl's broadside flipping the vehicle with all the expertise of a movie stunt. Brakes squealed all around me like a chorus of squawking birds, and I could hear the successive thumps of colliding cars piling up behind me in a drum roll of destruction. It was over in an instant, a cloud of dust roiling up from the shoulder where the girl's car had finally come to rest. Right side up, half buried in the shrubbery, she had sheared off one of the support posts for the exit sign that now leaned crazily across her car roof. The ensuing silence was profound. I pulled over and was out of my car like a shot, the fellow from the navy blue pickup truck right behind me. There must have been five of us running toward the wreckage, spurred by the possibility of exploding gasoline, which mercifully did not ignite. The white car was accordion folded, the door on the driver's side jammed shut. Steam billowed out from under the hood with an alarming hiss. The impact had rammed the girl head first into the windshield which had cracked in a starburst effect. She was unconscious, her face bathed in blood. I willed myself to move toward her, though my instinct was to turn away in horror. The guy from the pickup nearly wrenched the door off its hinges in one of those emergency-generated bursts of strength that can be duplicated under ordinary circumstances. As I reached for her, I caught his arm. Don't move her, I said. Let the paramedics handle this. He gave me a startled look, but drew back as he was told. I shed my windbreaker and we used it to form a compress, staunching the flow of blood from the worst of her cuts. The guy was in his twenties, with dark, cur dark curly hair and dark eyes filled with anxiety. Over my shoulder, someone was asking me if I knew first aid, and I realized that others had been hurt in the accident as well. The driver from the green Mercedes was already using the roadside emergency phone, presumably, presumably calling police and ambulance. I looked back at the guy from the pickup truck who was pressing the girl's neck, looking for a pulse. Is she alive? I asked. Looks like it. I jerked my head at the people on the berm behind me. Let me see what I can do down there until the ambulance comes, I said. Holler if you need me. He nodded in reply. I left him with a girl and moved along the shoulder toward a writhing man whose leg was visibly broken. A woman was sobbing hysterically somewhere close by, and her cries added an eerie counterpoint to the moans of those in pain. The fellow from the red Porsche simply stood there numb, immobilized by shock. Meanwhile, traffic had slowed to a crawl and commuters were rubbernecking as if a freeway accident were some sort of spectator sport, and this was the main event. Sirens approached. The next hour was a blur of police and emergency vehicles. I spotted my friend John Burkett, a photographer from the local paper, who had reached the scene moments behind the paramedics. I remember marveling at the speed at which news of the pileup had spread. I watched as the girl was loaded into the ambulance. While flash, bug, flash bulbs went off, several of us gave our accounts of the accident to the highway, po uh, highway patrol officer, conferring with one another compulsively as if repetition might relieve of its tension and distress. I didn't get home until nearly seven, and my hands were still shaking. The jumble of images made sleep a torment of sudden awakenings, my foot jerking in a se dream sequence as I slammed on my brakes again and again. 
When I read in the morning paper that the girl had died, I felt sick with regret. The article was brief. Caroline Spurrier was 22, a senior psychology major at the University of California, Santa Teresa. She was a native of Denver, Colorado, just two months short of graduation at the time of her death. The photograph showed shoulder-length blonde hair, bright eyes, and an impish grin. According to the paper, six other people had suffered injuries, none fatal. The weight of the young woman's death settled in my chest like a cold I couldn't shake. My office in town was being repainted, so I worked at home that next week, catching up on reports. On Thursday, when the knock came, I had just broken for lunch. I opened the door. At first glance, I thought the dead girl was miraculously alive, restored to, de restored to health, and standing on my doorstep with all the sol solemnity of a ghost. The illusion was dispelled. A close look showed a blonde woman in her mid-forties, her face etched with weariness. I am Michelle Spurrier, she said. I understand you were witness to my daughter's accident. I step back. Please come in. I'm sorry for your loss, Mrs. Spurrier. That was terrible. She moved past me like a sleepwalker as I closed the door. Please sit down. Can I get you anything? She shook her head, looking around with bewilderment as if she couldn't quite remember what had brought her here. She set her purse aside and sank down on my couch, placing her cupped hands across her nose and mouth like an oxygen mask. I sat down beside her, watching as she breathed deeply, struggling to speak. Take your time, I said. When the words came, her voice was so low I had to lean closely to hear her. The police examined Caroline's car at the impound lot and found a bullet hole in the window on the passenger side. My daughter was shot. She burst into tears. I sat beside her while she poured out a grief tinged with rage and frustration. I brought her a glass of water and a fistful of tissues. Small comfort, but all I could think to do. What are the police telling you? I asked when she composed herself. She blew her nose and then took another deep breath. The case has been transferred from traffic detail to homicide. The officer I talked to this morning said it looks like a random freeway shooting, but I don't believe it. God knows they've had enough of those down in Los Angeles, I remarked. Well, I can't accept that. For one thing, detective, for one thing, what was she doing speeding down the highway at that time of day? She was supposed to be at work, but they tell me she left abruptly without a word to anyone. Where was she employed? A restaurant out in Colgate. She'd been waiting tables there for a year. The shift manager told me a man has been harassing her. He thinks she might have, had, she might have left to try to get away from him. Did he know who the guy was? She shook her head. He wasn't sure. Some fellow she'd been dating. Apparently he kept stopping by the restaurant, calling her at all hours, making a terrible pest of himself. Lieutenant Dolan tells me you're a private detective, which is why I'm here. I want you to find out who is responsible for this. Mrs. Spurrier, the police here are very competent. I'm sure they're doing everything possible. Skip the public relations message, she said with bitterness. I have to fly back to Denver. Caroline's stepfather is very ill, and I need to get home. But I can't go unless I know someone here is looking into this. Please. I thought about it briefly, but didn't take much to persuade me. As a witness to the accident, I felt more than a professional interest in the case. I'll need the name of her friends, I said. I made a note of Mrs. Spurrier's address and phone number, along with the name of Caroline's roommate and the restaurant where she'd worked. I drew up a standard contract, waiving the advance. I'd bill her later for whatever time I put in. Ordinarily, I bypass police business in an attempt to stay out of Lieutenant Dolan's way. As the officer in charge of homicide, he's not crazy about private eyes. Though he's fairly tolerant of me, I couldn't imagine what she'd had to threaten to warrant the referral. As soon as she left, I grabbed a jacket and my handbag and drove over to the police station, where I paid six dollars for a copy of the police report. Lieutenant Dolan wasn't in, but I spent a few minutes chatting with, with Emerald, the clerk at identification and records. She's a heavy black woman in her fifties, usually wary of my questions, but a sucker for gossip. I hear Jasper's wife caught him with Rowena Hairston, I said, throwing out some bait. Jasper Sachs is one of Emerald's interdepartmental foes. Why, tell me, she said. She was pretending disinterest, but I could tell the rumor cheered her. Jasper from the crime lab is forever lifting files from Emerald's desk, which only gets her in trouble when Lieutenant Dolan comes around. I was hoping you'd fill me in on the Spurrier accident. I know you've memorized all the paperwork. She grumbled something about flattery that implied she, fl she felt flattered, so I pressed for specifics. 
Anybody see where the shot was fired from? I asked. No, ma'am. I thought about the fellow in the red Porsche. He'd been in the lane just to my, le to my left, just a few yards ahead of me when the accident occurred. The man in the pickup might be a help as well. What about the other witnesses? There must have been half a dozen of us at the scene. Who's been interviewed? Emerald gave me an indignant look. What's the matter with you? You know I'm not allowed to give out that information like that. Worth a try, I said equably. What about the girl's professors from the university? Has Dolan talked to them? Check it out yourself if you're so interested, she snapped. Come on, Emerald. Dolan knows I'm doing this. He was the one who told Mrs. Spurrier about me in the first place. I'll make it easy for you. Just one name. She squinted at me suspiciously. Which one's that? I took a flyer, describing the guy in the pickup, figuring she could identify him from the list by age. Grudgingly, she checked the list, and her expression changed. Uh-oh, she said. I might know you'd zero in on this one. Fellow in the pickup gave phony name and an address. Benny Seco was the name, but he must have made that up. Telephone was a fake, too. Looks like he took off and nobody's seen him since. Might have been a warrant out against him. He was trying to duck. How about the guy in the Porsche? I heard a voice behind me. Well, 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 Kenzie Malone. Hard at work, I see. Emerald faded into the background with all the practice of a spy. I turned to find Lieutenant Dolan standing in the hallway in his habitual pose, hands shoved down his pants pocket, rocking on his heels. He'd recently celebrated a birthday, his baggy face reflecting every one of his sixty years. I folded in the police report and tucked it in my bag. Mrs. Spurrier got in touch with me and asked me to follow up on this business of her daughter's death. I feel bad about the girl. His manner shifted. I do too, he said. What's the story on the missing witness? Dolan shrugged. He must have had some reason to give out a phony name. Did you talk to him at the scene? Just briefly, but I'd know him if I saw him again. Do you think he could be of help? Dolan ran a hand across his balding pate. I'd sure like to hear what the fellow has to say. Nobody else was aware that the girl was shot. I gather he was close enough to have done it himself. There's got to be a way to track him down, don't you think? <clears throat> Maybe, he said. No one remembers much about the man except the truck he drove. Toyota, dark blue, maybe four or five years old from what they say. Would you object if I checked back with the other witnesses? I might get more out of them since I was there. He studied me for a moment, then reached over to the file and removed the list of witnesses, which he handed to me without a word. Don't you need this? I asked, or I said surprised. I have a copy. Thanks. This is great. I'll let you know what I find out. Dolan pointed a finger. Keep in touch with the department. I don't want you going off half-cocked. Half End of part one. Continue with part two.